Welcome back to more Spellcasting 201. Ernie Eaglebeak is now a sophomore. And we are here at the main entrance of Sorcerer U. Two small fraternity houses can be entered. Your own to the southwest. Well, that's where we want to go. There's another to the west. A looming billboard faces the gate and a small sign hangs just next to the, next to the gate. To the south and east are large structures. The building to the east is topped with the school's trademark clock tower. Atop the tower, you can see the old statue of Marvin Melting Wolf. Let's examine the statue of Marvin Melting Wolf. The statue portrays Mar Marvin Melting Wolf, looking like the super serious visionary founder described by school lore. Before Melting Wolf founded SU, he was a metal worker, and a sculptor has seen fit to show the founder holding a sheet of metal bender. Rules. No undergraduates are permitted off campus without a pass. All students must return by midnight. No food or beverage may be brought back into campus. Magical plants or animals will have, be confiscated at the gate unless you've had authorization from a department head. Oh, so we can bring in normal plants and animals. That's good to know. Remember, once off campus, you are a representative of Sorcerer University. Please act accordingly. Underneath this last rule, someone has scrawled what? Act like a nerd? Wow. Why do sorcerers gotta be nerds? Um, let's see. Let's read the billboard. <clears throat> Expansion program. Auto ticking clock. The president. Brittle Bones and Sons contractor. Phase one. Additions to the steam tunnel system. Renovation of Donkey Dung Hall. Construction of new student union. Renovation of the library and rebuilding the boathouse. That's probably after a Kraken uh, attacked and ate one of the, dying, the dead professors that I fed to it. Grandma eat a pie. You're in the main living area of GEP, which is long-standing campus reputation as the wimp or nerd fraternity. In fact, everyone you know assumed you'd end up pledging GEP instead of HDP. A wide flight leads upstairs, and the doorways lead outside to the east. Now I have that happening in my house and in the game. Fantastic. I guess you have to go southwest. Hugh Delta Fart. Well, y'all fucked that up for me. Luckily, you can just restore and get your time back. You are in the main living area of Hugh Delta Fart. You're home for the next three years, assuming that you pass initiation rites, and assuming that you survive them also. A wide stair leads up, and narrow ominous stair beckons down toward a gloomy cellar. The grass is to the northeast. Eric Moltenrock, HDP's president, is here, staring vapidly into an empty corner. Chris Cowpatty, the pledge master, is sprawled on a couch, picking his teeth and sneering at all who pass. You see a trophy case. Okay, well, we're going to open that case. You fling it open. In the trophy case, you see a Pissex spell. A sextant, some insects. A sextant and a sexagenarian. Alright, well, first thing we need to do is clear some things up. A sextant. Uh, the first time I learned about a sextant was actually in Ultima 6. But basically, a measuring tool that they use in navigation. 
measures the angle between the astronomical object and the horizon for the purposes of celestial navigation. That is per the wiki. Now, a sextant, on the other hand, that's a person that uh, basically looks after the churchyard. Uh, hey, he usually has a little shitty place outside the church. First time I learned about a sextant, I believe, was in Monkey Island, too. Uh, but yeah, they can also act as grave diggers, things like that. Now, a sexagenarian, I had no clue what the fuck that was. This is simply a person that is from 60 to 69 years old. Sexagenarian. Had to look that one up. I'm glad we don't use that word anymore, and I'm also glad I'm not 60 yet. But I'll still be throwing down on LPs when I am. All right, let's get the, uh, let's get the, I kind of want to just take everything. Take all. You suck down a ale. You suck down a cold, foamy ale. Cushions, but if you took the cushions, you'd destroy the garish, clashing effect that generations of farts have been striving for. Uh, we take the pixie spells. We take the sextant. My score's gone up by 10. No, I like that. <laughs> taken, I've taken the 69-year-old, the gravedigger, and the insects, and all that shit. All right. A finger of energy leaps from the spell box to the spell will dazzling your eyes. When your vision returns to normal, you see that the spell box has vanished. Uh-oh, remarks Calipatty. Opening our hallowed Pissex spell is a major pledge violation. You're going to be in really deep shit if the brothers get wind of this. Calpatty's expression makes it perfectly clear that the brothers will most definitely get wind of this. Maybe I have to do it. Let's try not opening it directly in front of them. I don't think I'm going to take all the uh, other stuff, but we will grab the sextant. As you leave the living room of the frat, you hear cow powdery growl, Eric, my room now. I've got something on my mind. Normally your room looks like a hurricane just hit it. This actually is a lot better than in the first spell casting game. <clears throat> However, since you just moved into the frat and a lot of your stuff is still in summer storage, it merely looks like a very bad tropical storm hit the room. A flimsy duct runs up the wall of the room. Next to it, a door leads down to the first floor of the house. You see a trophy and a bed sheet here. On your bed, you see an envelope. First, I want to open this box. Okay, did not get in trouble for that one. All right, what do we got? Okay, uh, open envelope and read the letter. Ernie, I must speak to you about a most urgent matter. Please see me at the president's house at nine o'clock this evening. Sunday, auto ticking clock. Okay, we got, we're going to grab this bed sheet because I hear it gets cold around this time of the year. Well, we have until nine. I'm getting a bit hungry myself. Let's check out the fridge. You open the refrigerator or cr a crack, producing an odor so wretched that not only do you nearly pass out, you are sorry that you didn't. Needless to say, you quickly close the fridge again. All right, well, can't eat there. All right, back of the cafeteria. Greasy workers wearing greasy aprons, dispensing greasy food. Veal casserole is on the menu. Hey kid, calls the cafeteria worker. Come take a serving of casserole, it won't kill you.
I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit afraid to, to eat that. We'll try it out, though. You take a servant of casserole, a hush falls over the room, and then everyone begins whispering about your incredible heroism. You take a small bite, utterly repulsive. You wonder whether the university's management has fully explored the economic possibilities of using this casserole recipe as an artificial rubber substitute. There's absolutely no possibility that you could take another bite. The second bite was hard as it is to imagine, even more stomach turning than the first bite. Disgusting is much too polite a word. Revolting fails to describe the shuddering manner in which your stomach lining shrinks from the lump of chewed casserole. There is positively no chance that you could bring yourself to eat any more. Zero chance. Zip. Zilch. Nil. Nada. Forget about it. I'm doing it again. Summoning amazing reserves of strength or perhaps tapping into some secret suicidal fantasy, you swallow a third bite. This reveals a small larva which wriggles out of the casserole and into your hand. Technicians and lab coats from the Institute for Terminantly Foolhardy begin congregating nearby, waiting to claim your remains for dissection and experimentation. At the last moment, you reconsider this repast, and with a disappointing sigh, the technicians return to the Institute, empty-handed. And it looks like that's pretty much all you can do. All right, I think we're done here. Where else can we pass some time? Oh, we're back at the Frog Kisser house. Here's our D&D nerds. The astronaut is now wearing a chef suit. You're standing in the central lounge area of the primary on-campus dormitory. A stair ascends toward the housemaster's suite. There are exits to the north and southwest also. A hallway of ancient stone beckons to the northeast. A metal plaque adorns the wall. The usual role-playing crowd is huddled in the corner, deep in a game of malls and muggers. We descend on the escalator. You are on level six of a cavernous mall. A cheese shop and a grenade boutique can be entered here. The heavy door of the restroom is nearby closed. A down escalator ends here, and level six continues before you. The voices of the role players carry across the lobby of the dorm. We enter the restroom. You tried, but the door is locked. My car thief picks the lock. Success, the door unlocks. Sorry, Ernie, all the characters are taken. We'll get you in the next game. Should be starting in seven months or so, but you've got to promise to dedicate at least 85 hours a week. We open the door to go in the restroom. The restroom is a small, dim room of unpleasant smells. You surprised a band of five juvenile muggers. My bodyguard and my night watchman wield their automatic rifles. My cashier wields their heavy brick. The juvenile muggers wield jackknives. Attack! I yell. Attack gamers. <laughs> Alright, we attack the muggers. Roll the blue attack cube and two 12-sided dice. Success! Two of the juvenile muggers are cut to ribbons and the rest of the band runs off like little bitches. Each member of the party gains 300 shopping points. We search the area. You discover a canvas knapsack. My housebreaker checks for a trap. There is a trap. Open it anyways. My housebreaker disarms the trap. Unsuccessful. The trap is a pipe bomb. It explodes. Your housebreaker is vaporized. Your security guard successfully hid behind a urinal. All other members of the party take 10 damage. The knapsack opens. Your debutante finds 75 gold. Your security guard finds a credit card and your secret agent finds a tire iron plus four. Noise. We summon an ambulance. You can't summon an ambulance indoors, Pebble Brain. My registered nurse administers oat bran. All injured members are healed. The housebreaker remains dead. All right, it's 8 p.m. Uh, I'll call it Sunday. We leave the restroom. 
You're back in level six at the bottom of the, down the escalator. We enter the cheese shop. The proprietor of the shop smiles as you enter. He displays today's fine selection. A Gouda for 17 gold, a Havarti for 25 gold, and a Brie for 100 gold. Buy the Brie, buy the Brie! Okay. We purchased a Gouda and Havarti. Done, you have 144 gold pieces remaining. My registered nurse checks for poison. The Gouda's okay. The Havarti contains strychnine and is infected with Legionnaire's disease. I've never seen strychnine, which is rat poison, spelled out like that. I always just thought it was strick and then the number nine. All right, so let's see. Um, 810, we still got a bit of time. Where is, uh, bring up our map here. I believe we just go upstairs, right? You reach the atrium level six. The mall continues in four directions and up escalator leads to level seven. An armored car repair shop is open there. A band of eight hardened thugs is beating up a housewife here. A sister? My prison guard and my bodyguard assist the housewife. Roll both 40-sided dice, rescue dice. A pick purple card and give a morsel to the oracle hamster. Success! Five of the hardened thugs are bludgeoned to death. Two run away and one decides to join your party. The housewife gratefully bestows upon your party 50 gold pieces and a key to an all-terrain vehicle. You enter the repair shop. Your party is in a large greasy shop. A large greasy salesman approaches. He points out the daily special. A lightweight all-terrain turreted attack tank with only 8,000 miles on it. A steal at 1,500 gold pieces. We buy the tank using the security guard's credit card. Your credit card has declined. Your credit limit is only 500 gold. We leave the shop. The mall continues in four directions. We continue northward. The swing of level 7 dead ends here. Before you is a large reinforced metal door. A sign above the door reads Vault. There is a cluster of benches and potted trees here. The mall continues behind you. My housebreaker examines the door. Your housebreaker was vaporized about half an hour ago, lunkhead. Oh, right. Uh, my, wa my housewife examines the door. Your housewife reports that the door has a sophisticated time lock well beyond her meager lockpicking skills. Alright, we gotta get out of here. Phase 5 of the campus renovation involves rebuilding the boathouse on this spot. However, Phase 5 hasn't occurred yet. So we were able to reuse the author's favorite picture from Spellcasting 101, bravely shrugging off the worry that we might be criticized for being cheap and recycling old artwork. But Legend is the kind of bold visionary company that takes those sorts of gutsy chances. Pending the renovation, this is a rotting wooden dock, jutting into the river to the south. Curving paths lead back to the campus to the north and east. Nearby to the northwest on a gentle knoll at the edge of the river stands the president's house. The door is closed. This is the modestly sized but opulently appointed on-campus dwelling of the school president. Bowed pictures, windows provide panoramic view of the uh, river and its surrounding bluffs. A large desk of polished Fodunga wood squats in the corner. A carpeted stair leads up and a door leads southeast. On the desk you see the deplumit box. And you add that shit to your spell book. Okay. Well, he's not here yet. We can look around.
Carpeted stair, large desk, open desk. Oh shit. Auto windows. Hello, my boy. I see you got my um boat goat note, that's it. I see you got my note. Ask Professor about the box I just stole. Uh President? box do you mean? The Dep Lumet box. That's one of the torrent of free samples I get. You may have it if you like. Ernie, I asked you here to talk about the Sorcerer's Appliance. Last year, a little, a little episode convinced me that we must know more about the Appliance's powers in order to truly gauge its, um, gauge its, uh, Yes. Did you want to see me about something? Oh, wait, yes. I asked you to see you, didn't I? Ah, I remember now. I've decided to commission a secret project to investigate the powers of the Sorcerer's Appliance. And because of your involvement in last year's incident, I have chosen you for the honor. Fantastic. Fantastical, President. You can't use the word fantastical in this game. What about chesticle? What about testicle? As you know, Annie, much about the appliance is shrouded in mystery and law. You will know that it will not operate without its five great detachments in place, and that to activate it you must simultaneously press the black and white buttons. What you may not know is the legend, its origin lost in the same misty depths of antiquity as the origin of the appliance itself. This legend tells of a... <sighs> oh my, I think that's nap time is upon me. Are we through here? Ah oh yes, the legend, the legend of the having greater attachments, which would give the appliance and its master almost godlike powers. Um, quick note while I'm thinking about it, Cy Art, who's the guy working on uh, all the game hoarder artwork nowadays, uh, and the, of course, Ronstock Lug Lug Dark Sun comic that is going to be a smash hit. Um, he was watching this series thinking that this could have possibly been young Ronstock growing up, learning his early wizard skills in the uh, Sorcerer University, which, hey, it could work. I mean, he's gotten laid a lot, right? Or, he's gotten laid a lot already, so. Uh, Wouldn't be too far off. Is this guy gonna go to sleep on me or what? Okay, just checking. These um the, these even greater attachments, the sextant of spittle, the sheet metal bender of Balmoral, the donkey harness of Danderville, the cookie cutter of Curdle. The god about of Gecko and the bubble wand of Black Wand were once kept here at the university. In fact, under this very, uh, this very, what's the word? Oh, roof! Right, well, that's right. But they may have been missing for generations and are probably lost forever. Here's the key to Ivory Tower Laboratory. He placed an aged key on the desk. I've had an appliance move there, along with five great, um, great, uh, whatchamacallits, uh, I charge you to unlock its secrets and give me a full, um, that's it, complete, uh, report. His eyes sharpen. And hear this, young eagle beak, last night I had a premonition. That on each of the next five days, the appliance will play and fulfill a vital role in your life, and come Friday it will serve a vital role in my life, as well, and possibly in the very survival of Sorcerer University. The fire in his eyes fade, and his shoulders sag. Do be careful, young Eagleby. I've had the self-destruct pedal removed, but other dangers surely lurk among the appliance's secrets. He sags even further. And now, Ernie, you'll have to let this old man uh, take his, um, take his, um... Have you seen my spectacles? Otto shuffles slowly from the room. And we take the ancient key from the deskicle. Hey-oh! 
there she is. Opulent bedchambers grace the upper floor of the President's Mansion. Scallop bay windows give a panoramic view of the river below and the bluffs beyond. Between the windows and the stair leading down is a wooden dresser. Hillary Ticking Clock, President Ticking Clock's extraordinarily long young wife, is sitting on a set. Sate? Sate? Never heard of that. She is wearing a full length bathrobe and is swilling wine and munching from a box of chocolates. Hillary looks up as you enter. Annie, it's wonderful to see you. Ever since stupid old Otto took that stupid old president's job, we moved into this stupid old president's mansion. I never get to see anybody. She reclines on the set, and her robe falls open. You know with surprise that she has put on some weight. You know with absolutely no surprise that she is wearing only the vaguest traces of undergarment. So, so, sir boy, want to help me make up for lost time? Of course. That's what this game is about. You and Hillary tumble to the floor. As always, she gives new meanings to the word passion. Meanings such as more excited than a feral jungle beast overdosing on a mixture of amphetamines and pheromones. Meanings such as the total destruction of all furnishings within 50 feet of a sexual act. And that's just her foreplay. Hillary rolls aside. Uh, her afterglow is almost blinding. Not bad, sorcerer boy. She snarfs a lollipop and sucks on it. Please come again and again. I'm hardly ever busy, you know. And if you have any friends you'd like to send instead, or better yet, bring with you. Don't be a stranger. She tidies you up and escorts you to the door. Playing that victory sex music. Let's enjoy it. Alright. We are back to our old Ernie Eagle Beak banging ways. What else we got in here? Anything? The carpeted stair. Oh, she already, boot she already booted us out, it looks like. Rock in the dresser. I'll go ahead and take it. It doesn't really fit me anymore. Put on a pound or two lately. Besides, I don't think it's really revealing enough for my taste these days. You take the frock from the dresser. You begin to feel kind of sleepy, and with that big first initiation assignment of yours all set for tomorrow, it probably wouldn't be a good idea. Probably would be a good idea, or no, wouldn't be a good idea to pull an all nighter. We need to get back to our dorm room and take a nap. completely different. Cafeteria. I'm just looking around.
All right, let's go ahead. We're going to make a drop point for certain items here. I never did take the uh, trophy. Drop the manual. As you're leaving, Cow Patty growls, Eric, my room now, I've got something on my mind. Oh, well, there's my trophy. And my envelope. Let's see. The duct is apparently part of a heating system. Someone has written, or more accurately, scratched something on the duct, along with a crude picture of an ear. Let's listen to it. You hear the muffled voice of Pledge Master Chris Cowpatty. Yo, Eric! I can't stand that punk face runt eagle beak. Can you believe our pinheaded brothers bid that geek? That pipsqueak stumbles upon four black one by sheer luck, and now he's some kind of big campus hero? Bah! Well, he'll never become an initiate as long as I'm the HDV Pledge Master. We need to think up some really tough shit. Not like the usual powder puff assignments. I'll be given the other pledges. I've got it! Tomorrow for his first assignment, I'll tell that little twit to put a mustache on the clock tower statue. Tonight, you and I go up there and give the statue a rub down with coconut oil. The sucker won't be able to get a grip, and tomorrow night, we give him the boot. Okay, got the one up on you, bitch. Wanting us to deface the clock tower statue with an enormous mustache and make sure we fall from coconut oil? Well, not much we can do about it tonight, but at least we've been forewarned. It's time to sleep. You slide to the floor and fall asleep. Chapter 1. Statue of Limitations. I don't know why he didn't sleep in his bed. A wizard invented a serum to bring inanimate objects to life. He tried it out on a statue of General in the park. Sure enough, the General quivered, came to life, and climbed off the pedestal. The Mage was overjoyed. Tell me, General, what are you going to do in your new life? That's easy, bellowed the General. To start with, I'm going to shoot me about a million... What the... I'm trying to read. From the deepest sleep, you are jerked to your senses by what at first glance appears to be an unruly band of half-naked, chanting primitive tribesmen, but which second glance reveals to be an unruly band of half-naked, chanting primitive fratmates. Whooping, they grab you and roughly drag you downstairs to the cellar. Shivering and still half asleep, you are shoved against the wall as the chanting reaches a crescendo. Fraternity lore tells you that this hallowed basement chamber is haunted by the ghost of the many pledges who failed to survive the hazing process. Common sense, on the other hand, tells you that those ghosts have probably been driven away by the combined odor of advanced wood rot and cheap coconut incense. The windowless room is lit only by sputtering torches, illuminating a large rendering of the fraternity seal, a painting of dark red on the bare cement wall, as though in blood. The room is crowded with the already initiated juniors and seniors of HDP, wearing loincloths and covered with lurid war paints, and with your fellow pledglings. 
In a cobwebbed corner, you spy a rusty manhole cover. A narrow wooden staircase beckons toward the world of light. Eric Moulton Rock, the fraternity prez, is here, wearing face paint, ceremonial robes, and a vacant expression. You see Sid dances with sheep, and Gary Dirty Junk Pile here as well. That wraps it up for this episode of Spellcasting 201, folks. Stay tuned for more.